Okay. Yeah. Fine. So we, we saw all these wonderful ways in which um, the Holy Spirit has been moving, um, you know, across the Old Testament, right, right from creation. Right? Um, very interesting. We wouldn't have thought that, okay, you know, this is this is the Spirit of God who's doing doing this. You know, sometimes many many times we we think, okay, Holy Spirit, He releases the gifts, He He gives us He gives us inspiration, He enables us to put together a message, uh, He fills somebody, baptizes, uh, you know, fills somebody with power for witnessing. Yes, He does all that and so much more, and so much more. So by the end of it, we see that um, you know we. We, as believers, as disciples of the Lord, are more and more dependent on the person and the power of the Holy Spirit, uh, without which um, you can't do anything, without whom you can't do anything, right? So we are more and more dependent on Him. Okay, let's. We're going to look at a few more. Okay, so where did we stop? We stopped where Joshua was prepared for leadership as a leader. He's empowered as a leader by. Uh, by the Holy Spirit. So, so the, the thing that we understand is this: you know, many times the whole the task of leadership could seem very daunting in the sense. In the sense, it seems like it seems very intimidating. Okay, um, and so many times we we shrink back, saying, "I don't want to do this." Even the call of God, right? Maybe. Uh, you know, it's, it seems exciting. Oh, God has called me to do this. God wants me to do this. But many times we look at the task and then we say, uh, I don't think so. You know, let God choose someone else. I don't want to do it. Like Gideon. Like what did Gideon say? Gideon said, um, God, you know, I'm the weakest. Uh, our clan is the weakest. Our tribe is the weakest. And, uh, you know, I don't have... All these abilities, so choose someone else. Moses, despite all the thing that he learned in Pharaoh's court uh, or, or the the king's court, right? Pharaoh's court. He he says, you know, I I can't, you know, I don't have the ability, right? So while in the natural that may be true, right? In the natural that may be true, saying, okay, God, I I don't have any you know educational background, I don't have any you know all this. You know, I don't come from a family that's like four generations of pastors or, you know, or, or whatever, right? Whatever thing that you're looking at, they're not business people. And now you're asking me to get into business. And uh, I don't have all that, God. But the fact is that because he is called, the Lord can and the Lord will empower. Right? Because he is called, the Lord will empower. And that's what he did with Joshua. Right? Joshua was empowered by the Holy Spirit. He chose, he prepared, he selected Joshua, and he empowered him. Okay, so also in all our, you know, leadership positions or leadership roles, God will do that. Okay, okay, let's look at one more. Um, we see judges, right? We see judges like Othniel. I'm not going to go into the verses, but we see that the the, the same God, the same Holy Spirit, empowers them to lead the people. Okay, now this was at a time when Israel did not, uh, when Israel did not have a king. It was surrounded by all these nations, and God raises up these judges, and right? God raises 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 them up so that they would lead the nation, so that they would speak the will of God, the mind of God, to these people. Okay, um, let's move on to First uh, and Second Samuel, right? Okay, let's see First Samuel three. Um, Okay, chapter 3. Okay, and um, verse 1. Right, now, the boy, Samuel, ministered to the Lord before Eli, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. Okay, verse 19. So Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. 
Then the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Okay. Now, of course, we don't explicitly see the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, or the, the term Holy Spirit mentioned here, right? But we know that it is God who who raises up and establishes people in their roles of responsibilities. Now, after a long time, we see that uh, Samuel being established as a prophet, and we know that it is the work of God, God's Holy Spirit, right? So um, we see that he is doing it. Um, and also in 1 Samuel 9, you know, if you turn to chapter 9 and verse 9, Okay, formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go to the seer, for he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. Okay, So, so here we see that um, people in Israel, they went to the prophet. Why? Because he would speak the mind and heart of God to the people. Whether it was a king, whether it was, you know, they, they, when they wanted to inquire of the Lord. Now, that's another thing that we see that, well, they did not have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, all of us, as believers, we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. So we can personally, individually, we can talk to God and we can say, Lord, you, know, you show us. You show us. You direct us. You lead us. Okay. But we see that before the cross and before the ascension of the Lord, we see that this was how it was, that the Lord would come, the Holy Spirit would come upon a prophet, upon a seer, and the people would go to inquire and say, please tell us, what does the Lord think about this? Now, is this a good decision? The kings would go, and is this a good decision? Is, is this a good choice? Right. So, so that is what uh, we see, the Holy Spirit coming upon the prophets, coming upon these, um, you know, these people at these specific times and for these specific assignments so that the people can go and receive okay, counsel. Okay, then we read about Saul. Okay, King Saul, 1 Samuel chapter 10. And uh, we read uh, verse, yeah, let's, let's read verse 5, verse 6. And then verse 10, okay, 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 5 says, After that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is, and it will happen when you have come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Now, who's saying these words and to whom? Okay, who's saying these words? Samuel, to whom is he saying these words? To Saul, right? He's directing Saul. He's saying, this is, this is what will happen. You go, there will be a group of company of prophets coming down the mountain from the high place and they will be prophes prophesying. They'll have the instruments. And he says, the spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will also prophesy okay to prophesy is to speak forth okay to speak forth the heart and the mind of god okay that's all you know it it it, it might involve foretelling you know something about the future it may not also right but it's to speak forth okay so um so it happens the like the, the prophet uh, samuel is saying this will happen to you Saul. you go you do this and the lord wants to um, do this for you. He wants to come upon you and he wants so that you will speak the heart and mind of God, you know. And then uh, let's look at um, verse, uh, uh, let's go down to yeah, chapter 11 and verse 6. Um, well, uh, before that, sorry, before that, let's just go down to um, verse 11. Um, verse 9, sorry, verse 9. So it was, when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, that God gave him another heart, and all those signs came to pass that day. When they came there to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him, and he prophesied 
among them. And it happened when all who knew him formerly saw that he indeed prophesied among the prophets, that the people said to one another, what is this that has come upon the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? And so on. So we see something supernatural happening when the Spirit of God comes upon the people. Right? And the Spirit of God came upon the people. It was, you know, a, a random person like Saul who was to lead the people of Israel. Uh, at the same time, we see that, yeah, he was lead, supposed to lead the people of Israel as a king. He was not a prophet, like he was not a prophet, but then the Lord came upon him and something supernatural happened. He spoke the heart and mind of God. He prophesied so that the people themselves were amazed, He's saying, what is this happening? Okay, so God can do, the Spirit of God can do supernatural things, right? And one among them is the ability to speak, you know, giving man the ability to speak the heart and mind of God. You know, we're going to be learning about um, the gifts of the Spirit right? in detail. We're going to be spending a lot of time into each of these gifts, um, which are listed in 1 Corinthians 12. So, you know, one of which is, again, you know, prophecy, the prophetic gift, and we're going to be learning about that also, right? So it's nothing, you know, it's 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 nothing new or it's nothing great for the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is who He is, and this this naturally comes out. Uh, this is an expression of the Holy Spirit, right, through a finite man. Okay, so if we are thinking, you know, uh, you know, it's. Uh, prophesying, speaking for the hard mind of God, it's it's for special people, uh, it's it's not for me. Well, God can do that through you. God can do that through each one of us. Right? It's by the Spirit of God. Okay, right. Let's um, let's move on. And then we, then we see something something very sad, you know, something very um, unfortunate happening in First Samuel sixteen, First Samuel sixteen verse thirteen. Okay, verses 13 to 16. Um, and, and again, we go down to um, verse 23. Okay, I'm um, sorry, is it for 7, 16? Yeah. Okay, for Samuel 16, 13, right? 13, we see then Saul, so sorry, Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed, um, anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Okay, um, you know, uh, I was actually referring to another verse which is 1 Samuel 15 and verse 35, okay? 1 Samuel 15 and verse 35, it says, um, And the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. You know, it's, it's after that whole incident of, uh, incident of Samuel, sorry, Saul um, not worshipping or not obeying the Lord. And uh, this is what... The Lord says, you know, he regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Okay. And here we see that David is being anointed, right? Samuel anoints uh, David and anoints him in the midst of his brothers. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David and from that day forward. Um, then, you know, we, we see that, um, you know, uh, if, you, if you read verse 16, um, 13 to 16, we see a very kind of a difficult passage there. It says, uh, the Spirit of the Lord, verse 14, departed from Saul. Okay. Um, a very, uh, very sad state. The Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. Now, Saul was someone who was um, anointed. He was chosen to be king, but in everything, you know, he seemed to have departed from leading as king. Right, he disobeyed. Uh, he put up an appearance of, uh, you know, wanting to please the people more than wanting to please God. Uh, he, I mean, his disobedience was partial obedience, and all that we see. So we see that God, the Spirit of God, departing from Saul. Okay. So the question for us is, um, is this: Will the Spirit of God depart from us? 
what do you think okay we'll, we'll ask um, the online class also will the spirit of god uh, will the holy spirit depart from us if so under what circumstances uh, will he depart um, you know and and what time does he normally take to depart and come back etc okay so um sorry what's your name charisma okay charisma says um, the holy spirit won't depart unless we until or if we deny the lord jesus and uh, totally reject jesus yeah okay anyone else uh, blasphemy okay if we blaspheme god if we blaspheme the holy spirit okay okay i just want to mention uh, just one verse and um and but we're going to go back to it okay a little later but i'll just mention that here okay so so we are studying the old testament the work of the holy spirit in the old testament okay never forget that okay so this is all in the old testament a lot of things that he did in the old testament he will do today you know his he is not changed he will do today in our day and time Okay, a lot of things that he did, you know, prophesying, leadership, creative ability, uh, strategies for the nation, etc. Everything he does, until he does today as well, and he will do it today. Okay, but the way in which he moved in the Old Testament, we saw, you know, is different, right? Because he would come upon people for a season, empower them, uh, maybe even to complete their assignment, and then he would depart. Okay, um, let's turn to John chapter. Um, 15 sorry 14 john chapter 14 okay john chapter 14 and uh, verses 15 onwards okay 15 to 18 okay what does the lord say this is the lord jesus and he's describing pointing to something that will happen um, once he's gone right he says if you love me keep my commandments and i will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of God, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Okay. So turn your attention to verse 16 says and i will pray the father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you what does the word abide mean stay dwell right uh, and it's a it's a long term you know thing it's not a very short term thing so is that he may abide with you what is the word there forever okay forever right uh, how how long is forever It's quite a long time, I think, <laughs> right? Forever. So this this is the promise of the Lord Jesus, saying the Holy Spirit, he will come and he will abide with you forever, right? So that's the that's the time frame. He's saying he's going to stay, he's going to be with you, and he's going to be doing all these wonderful things, yeah. But yeah, he will not depart like the way we see in Saul's case. He will not depart. He will stay. And like Charisma pointed out, well, if there should there come a time where, for some reason, you know, it's going to be very difficult. But for some reason, the person just rejects the Lord Jesus and said, "I want nothing to do with Jesus. I, I completely reject, renounce Jesus, and insults." You know what we see in Hebrews ten: insults the Spirit of Grace. Well, we don't know. And we can't say, you know, hey, that person, Spirit of God has left that person. We can't say. We can't judge, right? So only God would know. We don't know. Right? There is a possibility. right? But for all of us who love the Lord and who want to please the Lord, you know, and in the course of doing that, maybe knowingly, unknowingly, uh, willingly, unwillingly, you know, we come at acts of sin and we, and we, we mess up. You know, we go through maybe a season of, uh, you know, just ignoring the Lord, neglecting the Lord. He will not depart. 
because he is here to change us from the inside out. He is here to convict us of sin. He is here to empower us, uh, empower us to fight against sin. Right? He is here to fight again, to make us fight against, strive, uh, or win the victory against the works of the flesh. Right? He is here to lead us into all truth, into freedom. Okay, that's the work of the Spirit. So He will abide with us. Okay? I just thought we should mention that because. Um, like even uh, you know in the psalm psalm 51 i think you know it says uh, where the psalmist says um, uh, you know uh, take not your spirit from me right the psalmist is actually repenting um, and he's coming back uh, is it 51 i just want to get that right hmm? sorry um, let's just get that Yeah, Psalm 51, right? Psalm 51 um, and verses 10 and 11, right? He's uh, repenting after his sin of adultery and uh, murder and all that. And he's saying, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Um, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. You know, so he he kind of uh, he knows the value of god staying with him psalm 51 verse 11 thank you prabhu so um yeah so yeah so we we see that i, I just see another question by sori uh, kamara what is blasphemy how can one blaspheme the holy ghost for uh, for which such sin isn't forgiven yeah so when we uh, when we read about blasphemy I, um, I think we looked at it earlier okay so when we look at uh, blasphemy uh, um, against the holy spirit so blasphemy is to say that um, something that is done by by god we are attributing that work to the enemy right uh, so which is what um, the pharisees did right when right after the lord jesus cast out that spirit uh, uh, and uh, and all the Pharisees and uh, all who were around them, the religious leaders, they said he casts out because of um, the, the because he's empowered by Beelzebub, right? who's the who's the prince of the power there, and he, he's he's doing it by that power. So the thing is this: immediately after that, the Lord says, you know, every uh, sin will be forgiven, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven because. Um, the thing is that they knew, they had seen, they knew all the wonderful works, the ministry of the Lord Jesus, and they came to a point where um, they knowingly and willfully, knowing that you know he's doing all this because of you know not wanting to lose their position because of pride, whatever, they maintain their position of you know saying that this is because of the enemy. They were attributing the work that he did by the spirit to the work of the, an evil spirit or Satan himself. So the Lord says, you know, that is the blasphemy, right? So it is not out of ignorance, but it is out of, uh, you know, knowing fully well that this is a work of God and turning around and attributing that to the enemy, right? So, yeah, so maybe, you know, in our ignorance, you know, that's that's a fear, no? People have, uh, hey, um, I said something about against the Holy Spirit. You know, maybe I've committed that unpardonable sin. Maybe that's it. There's nothing, you know, nothing in it for me anymore. But the very fact that you feel that hey, something is wrong and I need to get right with God, that's that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Just think about it, right? The 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 fact that you have that conviction of sin and you're not. You know, you're not just saying, okay, I'm, I'm just continuing to go in that direction. The fact that you are sensitive to sin itself is, is because of the work of the Holy Spirit. It's because of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. So therefore, you know, you don't have to come to the place of condemning yourself of, you know, uh, being in that place of uh, fear, saying, okay, maybe I, I will not be forgiven. We do a lot of things out of ignorance. Um, but... The fact is, you know, like the Pharisees, if we would continue to attribute things, knowing fully well that something is of God, and then we attribute that to the enemy, that is blasphemy. 
right? Okay, so um, that is some, yeah, I just, I hope that clarifies. Um, sorry, any doubts here? I think they're putting the questions. Yeah, Karen. Yeah. A distressing spirit from the Lord. Yeah. So Karen is asking this question, um, for Samuel 16 and verse uh, 14, right? Um, but the spirit of the Lord departed from from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. So, how can an evil evil spirit, you know, come from the Lord, uh, where He is holy and there is no shadow of turning at all? You know, that's so. These are some exceptions, or some difficult passages that we see. You know, again, um, you know, the fact is that uh, the psalmist, he would play the harp um, and then the spirit would leave. Right? That's what we see in verse 23. A distressing spirit would leave. Um, and so why would that happen even? Right? So that's a, that's, a, that's a thing. But the thing is, you know, when we look at the rest of scripture, okay, this is a verse that we see here, one, one verse. And I think there's another verse where it talks about a lying spirit okay, in, in the mouth of the prophets. Okay, So we, we see these two exceptions, but we know that God is holy. In him, there is no darkness at all. Um, so the only thing that we can conclude is that because you know Saul was rejected by God and Saul had moved into a place of disobedience, that he opened up his life for this distra distressing spirit to come in you know that's that's the only thing that we can say so it's not like the lord is sending you know the uh, the evil spirit or it's the spirit is coming from the presence of the lord so in the english language yeah that's how it is it it comes you know that's how the thing is so so we can't build the doctrine on it and saying that the lord sends the holy spirit and the evil spirit you know that would be wrong yeah yeah, but agreed, it's one of the, you know, some of these passages are kind of difficult. Any other questions? Yeah, Yeah, Sorry, sorry, he regretted, yeah. Lord regretted. Why did he even anoint him as king? Yeah, yeah, so the Lord, uh, yeah, that's a great question. So Rinchen is asking this question, you know, see, we read that the Lord actually uh, asked Samuel to anoint um, yeah, Saul as king, and um, so, so Samuel is the only one who does that, and after that, the Lord, you know, after all those things that happen, the Lord says, okay, I, I regret making Samuel king. So if the Lord knew, why did this happen? Uh, why did he even allow this, right? So the thing is that the Lord knows the end. The Lord knows the outcome. Um, but as human beings, he has given us free will as well, right? So he has given us free will uh, to, to follow after him, to obey him fully. He's given us free will. So we choose to you know, do that, either to obey or to disobey. Um, but Saul chose to you know, hold back, chose to disobey. Well, did God know that? Obviously, he would have known, because otherwise he won't be God. But still, God you know, gave that, uh, you know, he, he chose him as king. You know, you look at our, our, our lives, right? So, well, God has... Um, Maybe he releases in, us into ministry and, uh, you know, you're all here. God knows that the outcome of certain things, you know, certain choices that we would make. In life, but still, he would he has given us that free will. God knows that, okay, because of this free will, we would, you know, we can have the potential. We have the potential to make some choices, some unlawful choices, unrighteous choices. But God has still given us that free will right so so then you know we coming back to specifically about the holy spirit you know it's, it says do not grieve the spirit of god so the spirit is the same thing which is happening here he regrets 
and here in our case maybe he's grieved by some of the things that we do so so we can say god you know that he knew that you know i'll end up doing this so why did you give me that freedom why did he give me that choice but the fact is he has given it you know in his sovereignty he's given us free will uh, and it's up to us to make those choices so saul also had a choice he could either follow him fully uh, or you know disobey him um, but he disobeyed and the lord lord was grieved lord says i regret making it so that's uh, that's the thing does that answer yeah yeah okay okay so any other questions before we move on okay right okay let's move on to david um we go to um we saw that he you know for samuel 16 verse 13 the spirit of god came upon david and from that day onward let's move on to second samuel and verse 23 and we see that um, spirit of god moves him and he's inspired to write um, and all these psalms um Okay, now these are the last words of David, Psalm 23, I'm sorry, um, 2 Samuel 23 and verse 1. Now these are the last words of David. Thus says David, the son of Jesse, thus says the man raised up on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. Okay, verse 2. The spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spoke to me. He who rules over men must be just ruling in the fear of the Lord, and so on. Right. So, Psalmist, uh, King David, is known as the Psalmist of Israel, the sweet Psalmist of Israel, and we know that he wrote, you know, a, a lot of these Psalms that we see out of that 150. We see a lot of Psalms are written by him and others also. Um, but we see that um, as the Spirit of God, you know, he's anointed by the Spirit of God. Uh, and uh, he testifies here in verse 2, the Spirit of the Lord spoke by me. And when we read uh, about the Psalms, I'm sure you, you know, you'll be learning in praise and worship also. You see that a lot of these Psalms were prophetic in nature, like uh, are prophetic in nature, you know, these Psalms, which means the Spirit of God moved the psalmist to write certain things. Some of the things that he did not even understand at that, he would not have, that he's writing about how the messiah would would die would suffer and die and so on you know we we read about that uh, in the psalms so we see that he may not have had a complete understanding of it at that time but he uh, he he sang he prophesied uh, so a lot of this is prophetic in nature right so the psalms were birthed out of the spirit of by the spirit of god even as he moved on david to write these things okay um a very uh, uh, another interesting thing that we see is Second uh, Samuel seven. Okay, let's just move back to chapter seven. Okay, Second Samuel seven and verses verse one to seventeen. Uh, maybe I'll just um, pick a few here. Okay, um, and it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house that the Lord. And the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies. Then the king said to Nathan the prophet, saying, um, See, now I dwell in a house of uh, Seder, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go, tell my, go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent, and so on, right? Um, and then he talks about David, verse 8. Now, therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep, to be ruler over my people, over Israel. Okay, um, let's go down. Verse, verses 12 and 13. Okay. When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, 
I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he will, shall be my son and so on. Okay, so according to these words and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. Okay, then... Um, when we go when we go to verse 12 um, verse 12 um, sorry no um, um, sorry um, just just move to the last um, I just forget that reference. Okay, I'll just get that reference in a bit. Okay, so we see that uh, the Lord is actually putting that desire uh, or uh, instructing um, David through the prophet Nathan to build um, the, to build the house, right? build the temple. But actually, it's we know that it's actually Solomon who. Um, you know, builds it, and the Lord uh, confirms that also, right? Send gives that message also. I'll just share that um, reference a little later. Okay, let's let's move down. Let's go down to um, um, uh, Prophet Elijah, right? Let's go down to First uh, Kings eighteen and verse twelve. Okay, First Kings eighteen and verse twelve. Okay, First Kings 18. So we read, um, you know, when it comes to Elijah, when it comes to the prophet Elisha, and we see the Lord doing a lot of supernatural work through these, you know, ordinary um, uh, men of God, right? When I say ordinary, then they were all human beings, just like us. But then God did some supernatural things through their lives. Okay? And, and when we read through, uh, uh, King, the book of Kings, when we read through Elijah, Elisha, and also the other prophets like Ezekiel, we see that, you know, some, they they experienced and encountered God in some amazing ways, some supernatural ways, which, which actually beats any other, you know, uh, uh, human logic, reasoning, which goes beyond that, right? But we see that it is possible. Okay. Um, the reason I'm just mentioning that is because, you know, many times, um, in our day and age, right, with science and technology and so on, uh, which again, we know that it's from God and right? all this understanding and knowledge. Um, but in because of these advances, we sometimes, you know, play down the supernatural. Right? We see we uh, anything that we do not understand or anything that cannot be controlled in a in a lab or any kind of experience you know experiment we push it aside we tend to push it aside and say okay you know that is not valid okay. but we when we look at scripture we see that the spirit of god does some things that we would probably you know in our day and time you know because it beats human logic and reasoning, you would say, okay, that doesn't make sense, so it cannot be valid, right? But we see that God does amazing supernatural things through these people, right? Okay, so let's um, let's read this um, uh, chapter eighteen, right? Chapter eighteen, and this is a conversation that Elijah uh, has with Ahab. Uh, oh, sorry, with um, with Obadiah, right? So, and uh, verse 5, I'm just reading from verse 5. And Ahab had said to Obadiah, Go into the land to all the springs of water and to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass to keep the horses um, so that we will not have to kill any livestock. So they divided the land between them to explore. Ahab went one way by himself and Obadiah another way by himself. Now as Obadiah was on his way, suddenly Elijah met him. 
And he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is that you, my Lord Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go tell your master, Elijah is here. So he said, How have I sinned that you are delivering your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to hunt for you. And when they said he is not here, he took an oath from the nation, kingdom of the nation, that they could not find you. And now you say, go tell your master, Elijah is here. Okay, verse 12. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from you, that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place I do not know. So when I go and tell Ahab, and he cannot find you, he will kill me. But I, your servant, have feared the Lord from the youth. So what is he saying here? Elijah is saying, go tell Ahab that you found me, right? That we had this conversation. You just go and tell that he's here. So Obadiah is saying, you know, this is what will happen. The spirit of the Lord will, you know, I'll go tell Ahab. I, Elijah, Elijah, I saw Elijah here and I'll bring him here. But the spirit of the Lord will take you to some other place you know will transport you to some other place and then my life will be in danger because you know how ahab is and how he has dealt with people of other kingdoms when they, he could not find you there right so so which means that it seems to be a common understanding that the spirit of the lord would do this right would take would, would supernaturally transport people you know did it happen in the book of acts Right. We see that in the book of Acts also, right? We'll just, um, uh, do you remember to whom it happened in the book of Acts? The Spirit of the Lord would take someone from one place and take that person to another place. To Philip, right? So we see uh, Philip is actually in Samaria. He is, uh, you know, there's a lot of revival that's happening there. And from there, um, you know, he is supernaturally transported by the Spirit of God to another place, right? So, um, okay, let's, let's, uh, okay, I know we're just um, diverting here, but let's read that, okay? Um, okay, let's go to Acts chapter. Okay. It's immediately after. Okay, Acts chapter 8, right? Acts chapter 8. And uh, we are going down to... Okay, verse 20. Okay, did anyone get that verse? Verse 39, right? Verse 39. So, uh, from verse 26 onwards, like uh, the angel of the Lord tells Philip, arise and go to this place. And then he goes, he meets that uh, Ethiopian eunuch and then shares the gospel and etc. Baptizes him. And then verse 39, now when they had come out of the water, the spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Right? So, for us, it's like, you know, how could that, that thing happen? But, you know, you read that, you know, it's happened. It happened, you know, it, it seemed to be in commonplace during Elijah's time. And we see that happening in the book of Acts as well. We see this being mentioned here. And verse 40, it says, But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So Philip is also like, uh, you know, he's not s sitting here and wondering, wow, you know, from there I came here. How did it happen? You know, he just goes about preaching. You know, that's what we see. Okay, I'm here. Might as well preach. I'm preaching. The Lord did this. I can't explain it, but I'm, you know, I'm doing this. So we see that, um, you know, just to tell us that, um, just to point to the fact that the Holy Spirit does some amazing uh, supernatural work uh, and he, as he did in the Old Testament through the lives of these prophets, he will do so um, in our day and time as well. Okay, okay. 
uh, we have four more minutes. Let's let's look at a few more examples. Um, let's look at the life of David. Okay. Um, First Chronicles twelve and verses seventeen and eighteen. Okay. Okay. Would somebody like to read? Okay, yeah, that's fine. So David received and made them captains of the troop, right? So, so here, you know, we see um, um, you know very uh, unusual thing happening. Um, well, David needs this army, and uh, and the spirit of God is doing something to Amasai, and uh, he says this, and um, and, uh, and 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 a, and a work of you know increasing um, the army happens, right? It's again a supernatural work. What is what is it? it what is recorded here is that the super uh, the spirit of God came upon the chief of the captains, who's Amasai, and uh, he gives his allegiance. Allegiance meaning he gives his uh, support, right? Wholehearted support. He and his men. Uh, uh, he they give their support. He speaking on on behalf of the uh, you know of the uh, of the troops, and he gives his support. He says, "We are yours, O David. We are on your side, O son of Jesse. Peace to you, and peace to your helpers, for your God helps you." In fact, that message itself it's, it seems to be a, like a prophetic utterance. Right? He's he's giving that assurance to David. You know, uh, peace to you, and your God helps you now just think about it how this prophetic word and this prophetic act okay or the spirit inspired words and spirit inspired act would have you know sounded to david okay here he is and uh, he uh, he needs people he he needs help um and then you know his army needs to grow, and here is this person saying, "This is what it is." Okay, uh, spirit of God comes upon him, and he says, "We are yours. We are on your side. Peace to you. Your God helps you." Okay, must have been very reassuring, right? Must have been very reassuring, and also it's like an answered prayer, right? Out of some, out of nowhere, here's this person coming and saying that. He and the troops, yeah, you know, for him, and it must have been, as a leader, it must have been very, very encouraging, right? Can you think of any other instance where uh, uh, there are many, but you know, one particular thing where, for a leader, he hears these words from the people, you know, these words of assurance from the people. Can you think of? He's a new leader, and then he hears it. Uh, can you think of any uh, instance like that? Um, where he, where they hear, but in fact, he hears the words which God just, maybe in, 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 in just, just that conversation, God has spoken those words and he hears those same words repeated to him. That's a big hint. Sorry, Gideon. Um, okay, I, I'm not sure if it's Gideon, but definitely Joshua, right? In Joshua chapter one, he has this conversation, and uh, with God, and God says, "Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Be strong and courageous." And when he goes and instructs the people, the people tell him the same thing. He's saying, only you be strong and 
very courageous the very the very words that he heard from god the people echo it and you know they speak that word so when the spirit of god leads when the spirit of god brings you know this orchestrates these things divinely supernaturally it brings great assurance to the heart of the leader right? and it must have been very re reassuring for david when he sees these people and there's this divine connection brought about by the work of the spirit so you know in our day and time uh, you know how would that translate okay or how would that work out how would that apply well divine connections and right? people whom we did not know you know connecting to the work that you're doing okay maybe it's a work of ministry maybe it's a work of uh, even equipping for ministry okay or you know training for ministry and there is the spirit of god bringing about divinely supernaturally these connections and uh, and because of which you know you are moved moved into the plan and purpose of god right spirit of god does that okay Okay, so oh, we have gone behind, beyond our time. Okay, we'll stop here. Um, thank you. Uh, we'll stop right here, and then we'll pick it up in our next class. Online students, thank you. God bless. We'll stop right here.